All right, guys. Well, here we are. It is like 11 o'clock at night and uh, no migraine. I already covered this in the monologue, so I don't need to go like all into it, but I had a good day today. Spent the whole day like out feeding ducks with Nico and Karina. It's really been nice to be able to like get out of the house and just like spend time with them because she's pregnant and she needs that. Last night I ate. Um, I was really hungry and I like... I'm I'm one of those people that's just, like, I'm lazy. Like, you know, I don't know how many other people are like this, but, like, I'm so lazy that, like, I'll sacrifice eating something bunk because I don't have the energy to, like, make something better. For example, a non-lazy person, if they make a Top Ramen, which is a lazy person thing to make anyway, but, like, I'm so fucking lazy that I'll just go get tap water like hot tap water, like put a book over it for like three minutes. It's not even, it, it's not even soft at that point. It's like literally hard. I don't even care. It's like not even for the taste. It's like for the effect of feeling like I ate something. A normal person that makes the top ramen, like boils it, gets the noodles nice and soft, stirs the seasoning packet in it, makes it quasi-edible. I don't even do that. I don't give a fuck. I just want to not be hungry. Anyway, the point is, here I go and try, you know, I was like, oh, I'm not going to do a long monologue, but now I'm just going on some random shit. Last night, I was really hungry. And there's t a ton of food here for me to make, but I never make myself anything. Like, popcorn is about the extent of my culinary list of things that I can make on myself, by myself. And so I had, uh, what are those kind of, fuck, I forgot what they're called, like Dynamo, uh, Doritos. They're like, I don't know, they're like little red, like, t I don't even know how to describe it, but they're really spicy. Really, really spicy. And I was just like, fuck, I'm just going to eat this whole bag. I do that all the time. Like, I'm one of those people where I won't make a meal. I'll just eat, like, a whole bag of crackers or something. Their whole box of crackers. And, like, that shit is so toxic. It, like, burned my mouth. Like, my mouth is burned. I have, like, a sore in there. It's not an STD. I have that kind of shit on my dick. But it's not from eating chips. This is from eating chips. It sucks. There's really no point to explain all that, but I'm dealing with that handicap, just so you know. All right. Uh, did we already do the like, comment, subscribe, patreon.com slash Ryan Leone in the pinned comments? We did that, I think. I don't know. Let's get into the story. Oh, no, no. Last thing I'll say. I always fucking do that. You think that, like, you're off the hook and we're just going to go into the story and then I go off on some other bullshit. Uh... Oh, yeah. Okay, so this storyline, Albuquerque, I don't know why. This is like a part, like Boston was longer ago than this, but I remember it a lot more clearly. It's not even that I don't remember Albuquerque that well. It's that I don't, like I forget the chronology of like how it went down. So I like right before the video started, and I hardly ever do that, but I like put, I was like, all right. When did this take place exactly? Because when we started the series, I was talking about how I got to Las Vegas for my 21st birthday. The reason that I remember how that correlates to this story is because Jenny, who had become my future girlfriend, has passed away now. Rest in peace, Jenny. She gave me a fifth of Jack Daniels for my birthday. And I took that on the train. And I like drank it. After I did coke with that couple, and after I had sex with a stranger. So, so, I was like, alright, so that had to be for my 21st birthday. That's why she gave me the bottle. I, I, I remember that so clearly. But then I was thinking about it, and we I know I've discussed this, I, like, I've already pointed this out, but... I remember I was I tripped on acid on Fourth of July at that barbecue. I remember that. I mean, it's like not something you forget. And then I saw that girl's kid's dad, the bisexual one that I put the message on the dartboard for. 
So I was like trying to, I was like, fuck, when, when does this, like, wh like, where does this take place? Like, when exactly was this? So I really like put some thought into it. After I got uh, back from Florida, I don't even know if we've covered this period of my life. I don't, I don't think we have. Maybe. It's correct me if I'm wrong. When I got out of Florida, I still owed time in Santa Barbara County Jail. Remember I, le I ran out of the fucking courtroom before I left? Went all the way out to Florida. Caught a case out there. Got beat up daily in jail. Like, you're white. I hate you because you're white. I'm going to beat you up. I was like, okay. Five years from now, I'm going to vote for Obama. I hate racist people. I don't know. They were really racist black people. They hated me. Cause I, they're like, I hate you because you're white. I was like, what? Is it because I'm white? They're like, yeah. I was like, oh. thought you were joking. But they, really, they were like, they weren't even black. They were like Haitian people. And they hated me. I don't think they hated me because I was white, though. I think they hated me because I was a junkie and I shit my pants all the time kicking dope in the beginning. I mean, who, who likes people like that? Nothing to do with me being white. Anyway, after I'd gotten out of jail in Florida, I ended up going to Santa Barbara County Jail. I don't know if we've ever covered that, but I had to do like four months. Maybe we have covered that. That was the time where my parents told me that I had to turn myself in. That was like the deal with me coming home. So I turned myself in thinking I was going to get out the next day. The judge laughed at me. The judge balked. So like, Whoa. You left California, you caught a new felony after running out of my courtroom? Fuck you. Four months. And I ended up, and that was like right before Christmas. I was mad. I was like, oh my God. And then so I had to go do that time. So I was 19 at that point. 20. I was 20 at that point right there. When I got out of there, my dad said that I could move anywhere I wanted to in the country. Anywhere. And I wanted to go live with Paul in Monterey. Even though I hadn't talked to him in like a long time. He was like homeless up there at the time. But somehow it all worked out. I ended up going to Monterey. Paul was my roommate. It was a very odd time for me when I was in Monterey. I think we have covered some of that time. Remember I had that like Asian girlfriend that would like... I don't even think we had any conversation besides like her calling me and being like, hey, let's fuck. I'd be like, all right. And then she'd come over and she'd be like, thanks for fucking. And then she'd leave. That was it. I like, I don't think we we exchanged more than like 40 different words beyond that the whole time. And that's pretty much like all that happened. I was going to raves out there. I was strung out. We were boosting. Paul and I were boosting from Home Depot a lot. Drank a lot during that period. No, I, I wasn't really drinking before that, but that period I drank just because he did. And then when, at the end of that, we did go over this on Patreon. That's when my dad's friend came and had found me um, when I was in my apartment. I was like, where I'd like shit myself because I was in bed and I just gave up on life. Cut my dick off, put it in a manila, all right, anyway. So after that period, so so after um, after Monterey, I don't remember how long I was there. Maybe a few months or something. I don't even I don't even know if I made it that long. I really don't remember how long it was. My dad would probably know these things. But after Monterey, I ended up going back to Florida to go to detox. Then I went back to Orange County, and then I came back. Well, I went to Orange County. I got kicked out of that rehab for having sex in a shower. The girl. Let me clarify that. And so after that period, so that was like, I'd gone from Monterey out to rehab to Florida for like a week. Treatment in Orange County, although I don't really remember how long. I think it was like a month or so. And then I came back to Santa Barbara. And there was this period between when I got kicked out of that rehab in Orange County to when I met Jenny and I started selling drugs. So this is the period that we're talking about. So I was like 20, turned 21 in that period. 
Now, the reason that I just spent that much fucking time going through, like, the chronology of this is because it's that confusing to me. Because we've, like, splintered off into different storylines on Patreon, so I'm like, oh, where, where am I? So that's where we are. So I'm going to, like... The, the one area of confusion that I had was... Um, was if I was 21 or not. It really doesn't matter. You're probably like, who cares? But it kind of does matter. Because there there was something that happened right when I turned 21 that had to do with this story. So I'm trying to think of like how it makes sense chronologically. I can't. So maybe like you'll just listen and you'll be like, oh, okay, well, that makes sense because of that. I don't know. I was trying to think of this before uh, I started the video. But anyway. So when I got back from Albuquerque, I'm not even sure how long I was there. I want to say like six weeks. It was not that long. Like that whole train wreck of an experience out there was probably like a little over a month, I want to say. And then I came back and I burned those guys on the train. It's poor backpackers. Took like their life savings. That, I remember that first night... I went to my friend Roland's house who really like kind of deserves his own series. Cause that guy was just like a lot of really crazy shit went on at that guy's house. But I know that my parents were mad at me and I know that right when I got back, I ended up scoring heroin off that guy that I'd met on the train. I went like right back into a run, you know, in Santa Barbara and Roland was like, at that point, his house had just become like a free for all or like dead animals, like hanging from lamps and shit. It was really weird. And I'm not even joking about that. That was like the straw that broke the camel's back with him was that he had a dead cat. He was like trying to feed it. He was like trying to force wet food into this dead cat's mouth at one point. I don't know exactly when, but I, that was like where I was like, well, okay. This guy probably needs help. Should probably tell his mom that he's feeding dead cats. I like had to make that call. It's like, hey, your son's been feeding a dead cat. She's like, yeah, so. I was like, all right, just letting you know. Uh, hey, I got another call. I gotta go. But it was like at that time period, like 2021, really doesn't matter that much. I think I got the Vegas trip out of order. I think that's like the point. But just so you know this chronology. During that time period, Roland's house was like a free-for-all, right? Like local Santa Barbara tweakers had found out that like there was some guy that wasn't all the way there that owned that property. Like, a, like a, it wasn't a big house. It was probably a two bedroom house, two or three bedrooms. And he had like a nice jacuzzi or he had a jacuzzi in the backyard, he had a boat. He had some garage that like he smoked meth on a candle in. And by that period, like I remember going over there, there was like all these homeless tweakers and there were like doll parts and shit. Parts of like microwaves. I was like, do you need that microwave door? He's like, yeah. This is one of the tweakers. Not At that point, Roland wasn't even talking. So I get back, and, like, that's the kind of atmosphere I go to because my dad's mad at me. I remember calling him and, like, trying to explain to him that what happened when I was out in New Mexico. My dad was just like, hey, like, we talked to her, and, like, apparently you stole some DVDs from her. How could you do that to her, Ryan? She was just trying to help you. I was like, Dad, she was a slut. I bet she didn't tell you about the guy with dreadlocks, did she? My dad's just like, Jesus Christ. Like, at that point, he was, like, so fed up with my shit. And he wouldn't let me back in the house. He's like, no, that was the deal. You go out to New Mexico and get sober. You're on your own. So this started, like, a period where I was, like, pretty much couch surfing. Now, Jeff lived with his parents at, at that time. And I'd go sleep over there once in a while. It wasn't like I was allowed to all the time. Now, the reason that I didn't stay at Roland's all the time is because I'm not even joking. The tweakers that were there were like, they were like 
actual sex rides going on there. I'd like show up and everyone would be in safari outfits. I'd be like, what's going on? They're like, safari themed sex party. I, I'm like not even joking. Like really debaucherous, like weird sex parties would happen there. And it would be like all dudes. I'm like, um, I'm going to stay at Jeff's tonight. This is too weird. And Roland would just be like sitting there like smushing wet food into a cat's mouth, dead cat's mouth. So I kind of was like playing this musical chair routine. Anyway, as I discussed in earlier videos, one of my primary hustles during that point of my life was middleman and cocaine. Like I, I always had, probably just because I was a coquet, I always had good coke connections in Santa Barbara. And there was a lot of people that I'd gone to high school with. They were kind of like preppier than me. I'm like, ew. I can't deal with that guy. I don't speak Spanish. I'm like, dude, he's Native American. But okay. Give me 140 bucks. I'll gladly tax you $50 on this eight ball. I'm gonna get... The guy was getting balls for like 70 or 80 bucks. 70 was like the best I'd get him for, but I think 80 was like the general thing. So like a lot of that time period was me middlemanning cocaine. And it sucked and people didn't trust me, you know? So like they'd never just like give me money I tried that a few times. I'm like, would I be like, yeah, give me 120 bucks. Well, dude, I'll see you in like 30 minutes. I swear to God, I'll be, and then I would never show up again. So people learned their lessons. So they would like pick me up and like make me go score for them, but they'd keep me on like a short leash. So anyway, point is, eventually, they would start inviting me to parties this is one of the interesting things about santa barbara is that yes i was a dirtbag but santa barbara is like an upper middle class town a lot of these people's parents lived in like 10 15 million dollar houses these huge just obscene mansions and there'd be like all these kids just partying there that went on when i was in high school but this was a period like i said i was probably like 2021 20, there were still pretty high-end house parties going on. <clears throat> you know, people were still doing stuff like that. So they started inviting me to parties with them. Not because they liked me. You know, and I, like, I saw right through that. I never got invited to one of these, like, fancy parties just so that I could, like, socialize. They'd be like, hey, man, you have to sit on the lawn chair outside. When we need blow, we're going to come get you. But it's cold out there. I don't give a fuck, man. Do you want a party or not? Give him a beer. I'm like, thanks, bro. I'd just be like sitting outside drinking and then they'd get all wasted and like want coke and they'd be like, all right, man, let's go get some blow. And I'd like have to get in the car with them. We'd go to the east side of Santa Barbara, wherever I was picking up the coke. And that was like my life at that point. So there's one, so I don't know where, I don't think I had like a consistent place that I was living. I think it was most of the time I was at Roland's house. And if you remember, around that time, I started working for that guy JP again. JP is pretty much a reoccurring character in my life. From the time that I got out of high school until the time he died last year, I think he passed away last year. He's the guy that got shot in the face when we were leaving the Commerce Casino. I posted a picture of that on Patreon, like a Facebook post. He's like, I got shot in the face at Commerce. I was with him that night. It was fucking wild. But he was like a reoccurring character in my life. And if you remember this story, this is like an old school story that I did on YouTube a long time ago. He had like... At various points, he'd set me up as a runner. So, like, in the beginning, he'd have me go to nightclubs. There's not a lot of nightclubs in Santa Barbara, but this is before I was even 21, and he had me sit in the bathroom stall. I'd set up shop all night. There was another period where he rented me a car. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to Hawaii for a month. Here, I'll rent you a car. 
bring it back on this date, bro. And I never brought the car back. And it, like, completely fucked his credit. He still was my friend after that. He, like, he was mad, though. Remember, he, like, punched me, made me go steal a surfboard. And there was another time where he made me, like, go out to Connecticut and bring ounces of crystal meth out there. I think I've told that story as well. But this is the period when I'm going back to when I was living with Roland and one of our friends, I like, I would stay at his house and I'd go to these like house parties with a bunch of Coke that JP had given me. So I'd gone from like middlemanning during this period to like actually having a bunch of like grams. I'd have like 30, 40 different individually wrapped grams like in my backpack, go to house party, sell it, make a bunch of money, give it to JP, give me more. And this one night, the guy came home with me. He had a bunch of money. He's a guy I'd known for a long time. Remember this story? And he's like, I'm already. I was like, let's get a hooker. Like, we didn't know any, but we like looked up hooker in the yellow pages and we found like an escort service. It's like escort strippers. And I was like, yeah, I think that we just like call them and then we can have sex with them for money. This girl ended up coming over. She ended up stripping for us. And uh, my friend was like, yeah, dude, ask her if she'll fuck for money. I was like, I don't want to ask her that, but I ended up doing it. I was like, hey, will you have sex with my friend for money? She's like, shh. Remember this story? And then she made us go to like some little like trailer that she lived in when she got off work because she was like still on the clock. Wouldn't want to have that happen. And then I go over there and this guy was like twacked out on meth. Like, we've been doing coke all night. He started doing meth, like, with her. And he's like, oh, dude, see if she'll give me a blowjob. I was like, you know, dude, I'm going to go home. And I ended up leaving. And, yeah, at that, and then I, at that time, my parents let me stay with them, like, here and there. So, like I said, it was like musical chairs. Like, sometimes I'd be at Roland's, sometimes I'd be at Jeff's, sometimes I'd be at other people's houses. Sometimes I'd be up at my parents'. That particular night, I was at my parents' house. Or, like, I went there. I was just over it. It was, like, 6 in the morning. My, like, tweaked-out friend was, like, trying to get a blowjob from some stripper in a trailer. I was like, you know what? This is just I'm cool. I'm going to go home. And so I left. And then this this girl, I, like, ended up moving into a halfway house shortly after that. That My parents, like, made some probably made some deal with me where I had to go live in a halfway house. They're sober living. And this girl tried to blackmail us remember the story and like we like tape recorded it and like went up and met her up in the mountains and i played her the tape recorded shit where she was trying to like extort us for rent money yeah, it was a wild it was a wild time but that was this period so um so anyway so one night I don't know if I was living in a sober living or not, but whatever. It doesn't really matter where I was staying. The point of the story is the one night I got picked up by like these like rich guys and I had Coke on me. It wasn't like I had to go get it. Like I had a bunch of Coke on me. I probably had like an ounce or something, like, you know, like that much Coke. They picked me up and these guys were all drunk and they took me to this town called Montecito. Now Montecito is... The really, really, really rich part of Santa Barbara. That's where Oprah lives. That's where... It's the prince and her... His princess wife. Who are they? They're, like, pretty famous right now. They live there right now. Um, this is, like, a very nice part of Santa Barbara. It's just huge mansions. And I don't remember why, but for some reason they, like wanted me to like go on a drive with them like they didn't want me just to hook them up with the sack maybe that you know a lot of times back then like once I went from middleman and coke to actually selling it for my friend because it, before that I was just middlemanning it and I'd make like 40 50 bucks and I'd spend whatever money I had on heroin it was a horrible horrible shitty existence by the time that JP started flowing me, and there are different periods, like I said, but this particular time, I was making a lot of money off selling Coke for him, but it would all go in my arm because I was shooting the Coke, mixing it with heroin or I was smoking it or whatever. 
So a lot of times I was so used to middlemanning Coke for people and I make money off middlemanning it, but I'd also be like, come on, man, let me get a line. That was just part of my routine. So I think that's what was going on that night. But whatever the case was, we ended up driving into Montecito and these guys were buying whatever. And we like, they were like really drunk that night. And I remember that I wasn't, I was like, probably, I think I was the only one that wasn't drunk. I was on heroin or whatever, but I wasn't, I wasn't like sloppy, belligerent, drunk like these guys were. So I was in the back seat and we're, I'm like making lines up on the CD case. And this guy that's driving is like swerving. So I keep telling him, I'm like, Hey man, can you pull over? Like, I don't really feel comfortable being in the car with you when you're this drunk. He's like, oh, don't be a pussy. You know how people get when they drink. So finally he pulls over and he lets me drive. Now I'm sober, like I said. And like my logic was like, all right, the only sober guy here, I should definitely be driving. So now I'm driving the car. I have an ounce on me, I believe. Something pretty significant. And I think these guys bought an eight ball. They bought like three and a half grams. And they had a CD case where they were making lines. So we're like driving up into these like pretty isolated mountain area of, of Montecito. Where there's not a lot of police or whatever. And I'm driving cool because I'm not drunk. I'm not swerving like, like these guys were like going, you know, like zigzagging across the road before I was driving. So they're making their lines up. And I was like, all right, well, let me get one. Even though I shot and smoked it, like I, I wasn't above snorting it. So they hand me the CD case. And I remember there was like quite a bit on it. Maybe they only had like five or six lines made up, but there was like a pretty fat pile of Coke on the CD case. And I was like trying to like, I was like here, roll up. You know, roll up a $20 bill so that I can snort it. I was going to have somebody hold the CD case so that I could snort the Coke while I was driving. And right as like, and you know, that's like, you got to like put your knee up on the steering wheel because I wasn't stopping the car. I was still driving as I was doing this. It's like a whole art to it. I had gotten good at it. So I had like my knee up and I was trying to drive the car and I was ducking down to do a line. And all of a sudden, police lights, like, you know, red and blue flashing lights just, like, flood the car. Whole car is illuminated by police lights. Now, these guys are straight. Like, I'd been in and out of jail for a while now. I'm not saying that makes me tougher. That probably just makes me more of an idiot. But I think I was, like, and I was not drunk, but I was coked out. And I was, like, the only one that went. They were, like, oh, my God. Do you think that we're going to get in trouble for being in a gang? I was like, what? No, shut the fuck up. I was like, dude, just put everything away. You know, so these guys are trying to get as much of this Coke off the CD case as possible without like ruining it. Like I'm trying to tell them like, here, put it in this little baggie. I had like some empty bag on me or something and I like had pulled it out. Anyway, the point is, is like I knew well enough to get the bigger sack that I had and stick it up my ass, you know, at least cheek it. These guys are just freaking the fuck out. And by this point, and I'd like learn this maneuver, by the way, like when police lights go on like that, when you're getting pulled over, you should always take as much time as possible to like hide everything before you come to a complete stop. Just kind of like play stupid. This works well, like, if you're on the freeway, but we were, like, in some isolated areas, so it didn't, just kind of looked bad. Like, we were, like, driving, and they're all, like, shuffling to put everything away, and, like, these lights were, like, staying on us. I'm focused on just putting the sack up my ass, which I did. And now, I'm, and these guys are freaking out. I'm like, just act cool. Like, I'm not drunk. There's no problem. Now, at that point, my legal status, by the way, I wasn't on probation anymore. When I had come back from Florida and I had done that four months or whatever it was, it was called a terminal disposition. So they cut my probation off. So I wasn't on probation. So I was like, in my logic, I'm like, all right, I'm not drunk. I'm not on probation. 
as long as these idiots don't act like erratic right now and as long as they got rid of all the evidence we're not gonna get what are we doing i'm just driving around in the middle of the night so we pull over like on some dirt like uh, it was like some dirt area i don't know what it was probably a driveway of some like mansion it was like just the front of their house wherever i'd pulled over and i'm like sitting there i'm like all right guys be cool see the cop or probably like look in the mirror and I see there's a cop coming on my side, but there's another one on the other side. There's two cops, sheriffs, not even cops. These are Santa Barbara sheriffs. I think there's only Santa Barbara sheriffs in Montecito and sheriffs are way worse than Santa Barbara. Now I'd given him a bag to like put the Coke in, but the guy hands me the CD case and there's this fat fucking pile of Coke on it. It's like, here, do something with it. I'm like, dude, what the fuck? You had plenty of time to... Jesus Christ. I didn't have time to, like, do anything with it. And I just kind of, like... And I still don't want to lose the Coke. That's how much of a drug addict I am. I'm like... I, like, can't just, like, dump the CD case and have the Coke all over the floor. That wouldn't have worked anyway, because they would have put a flashlight and seen all this white powder everywhere. So I tried to get the CD case and, like, kind of, like position it under the seat so that it's still standing up so that there was a possibility maybe they wouldn't see it you always like cling on to that well maybe they won't see it but i pretty much knew i was fucked cop comes up shines the light on me how you doing tonight i was like good they're shining the light on like these other guys now these other guys like i said they're fuck they're coked out have no experience with law enforcement. All of their dads are like stockbrokers and shit. And they could be more obvious. They're all just like... Like, you know when people try to look like they're not being suspicious, but they look like way more suspicious than if they just acted normal? These guys are like all tense. They're like holding their breaths. They're all like turning beet red. Cops like, where are you going tonight? I was like, um, just going to our friend's house. He's like, yeah, what's the address? So it was one of those cops that's like quizzing me, asked me a bunch of different questions. And I'm like not on my best game, you know. I'm all coked out too. I'm trying to like make up some story, but I don't remember what I said. But anyway, the cop ends up asking if there's anything in the car. I was like, like what? He's like, don't act like that with me. Drugs, alcohol, guns. Now these guys have said nothing that I'm with. One of the dudes in the back, I don't even remember the guy's name. It was just some random guy that I probably was hanging out with for the first time. It was just one of these other people that I knew that I'd gone to high school with his buddy. He goes, you're not searching our car, pig. I'm just like, are you serious? Yeah. Cop whips the flashlight in the bag. He's like, what did you say to me? He said, you have no right to search your car, nor fucking right. You're a pig. Fuck you. But you don't talk like that to sheriffs. So, you know, obviously, his partner ends up opening the back seat, tugs this guy out of it, violently throws him on the floor. I'm like, I know at this point, and I'd always been the kind of guy that, like, talk shit to cops. I couldn't believe he said that. He's like, if you're not searching our car, pig, I was like, oh, my God. That's how some some people just get like that. They, like, crack under pressure and just get weird. Like, that's going to do something. Yeah, scare them away, bro. Good job. So I'm kind of just, like, holding onto the steering wheel. I didn't have any ID on me or anything. Well, whose vehicle is this? I was like, I don't know. One of these guys. I didn't even know which dude's car I was using. So they're, like, cuffing the guy that was talking shit to them. I don't even know what was going on with him. I just know what's happening with me. Finally, the cop's like, well, you know, I really do appreciate you being cordial with me, sir, but I'm going to have to ask you to step out of the car. I was like, all right. <laughs> what was I going to do? So I end up getting into the car. Makes me do a field sobriety test. So I've always been one of those guys We've talked about a million times. 
where I can come up with stuff pretty quickly to say to cops that's like witty to get myself out of stuff. Or I come up with a plan, like the time I peed in the taco cup bell, or taco bell cup, time that I stuck the key up my ass, stuff like that. Bacon's a science, cooking's an art. So my plan this particular time was to like, he was obviously like wanting to get me for driving under the influence. Cause I was coked out. I mean, you could probably see it. My eyes were probably all glassy and I looked like I was cracked out, you know? So my plan was to try to take as long as I could on the field sobriety test so that maybe like it would, maybe they wouldn't look under the seat because that CD case with the Coke is just sitting under there. Plus I have like an ounce stuck up my ass. Like I knew I was straight fucked. Especially if there's like canine dogs. There weren't at, that I saw at that point. So I'm like trying to take a long time being obnoxious, whatever. Finally I pass. You know? I'd be like, he'd be like, all right. Touch your finger to your nose. I'd be like, like, should I do it to my ear? To your nose. I'd be like, right here? So come on, man. I'm like, oh, okay. You know, I was doing stuff like that. Finally, I pass. And he goes and just starts searching the car. He never asked to search the car. They had detained the other guy that had talked shit to him. Stupid. Pretty sure if that guy hadn't said anything, they probably would have just left us alone. You know? They had no reason for pulling us over. They literally just pulled us over and were like asking us what we were doing. It was just harassment. See a bunch of crack kids in a car in the nice area at three in the morning. How dare they pull us over? So he goes and he's searching the car. Finds the CD case under it. He pulls it out. They, these guys left like a fat mound of powder. I don't know why they had all this time to get rid of it. to put. I gave them a bag. Cops like, what is this? I was like, I have honestly, I have no idea what that is. He's like, you don't know what this is. Powder on a CD case. You know what it looks like to me? I was like, ah, no. Looks like cocaine. I was like, oh, come on, man. We're like in our early 20s. Who does that? Like shit people did in the 1980s. We don't do stuff like that. Of course, he wasn't buying it. So we all end up getting detained. I get handcuffed immediately. And they put the... Um, they put the CD case like on the top of the hood and they took out some like kit. I never saw cops test drugs before. It's the only time in my life I think I've seen that. He pulled out some kit where like you could dip in these, it's like a dropper or something. He dropped it on the Coke and it turned blue. And he's like, it's cocaine. I was like, no way. I'm like, do you have any statements about whose cocaine this is? And I didn't make any. I was like, nope. You have the right to remain silent. So I ended up getting arrested for that. Possession of cocaine. Now, I still had the ounce in my ass like that. I remember we were in the back of the car and these guys were just freaking out. You know? The guy, like, one of the guys that I was with was like, should I tell him that I got it from you? I was like, dude. Please stop being a bitch like this. You know, I was like, if you're acting like this in the back of a cop car, when you get to jail, you're going to get raped. He's like, oh my God. So their friend was like all excited when I said that. I couldn't believe his friend did that. Totally got us busted. So anyway, so we end up going to jail. I get charged with possession of cocaine. That's the second time. That's that was the th third possession I got or something. I think that was the third or fourth possession that I had gotten. And it really pissed me off because if that guy hadn't said anything, I would have never gotten busted. I was also strung out at the time. Now, this is back in like 2005, 2006. Santa Barbara jail to this day is still wide open. A lot of jails are. They don't make you do anything. They don't make you squat and cough. They just put you in a room where you change out of linen and uh, or you, you change into the little jumpsuit. They don't even search you. you know, that was... And you got to remember, like, before that, I'd been on drug court, so I'd been going in and out of that jail with drugs for a long, long time. I was already hip to it. So they never found that coke. I end up getting booked in. believe that it was a Saturday. 
may have been a Saturday, it may have been a Sunday, whatever the day was. I know I had to stay in there like a couple days before they let me go. I wasn't on any kind of probation. And I just happened to get lucky enough that the tank that I landed in, there was like some short paisa guy that had heroin. Cocaine is like not a common drug for you to bring into jail. Like occasionally somebody gets arrested with them and they'll shove it up their ass like I did. But I showed up there with like an entire ounce of blow. And I was able to trade and I was able to stay well for however long I was in there. I think it was like a day or two. So anyway, at that point, my dad was like really pissed off because now I just gotten like an entirely new charge. You know, I told him about it. Try to tell him the whole story. I was like, I was with the, it's like, it wasn't even my coke dad. He was on a CD case. This guy started calling him a pig. My dad's like, just shut up. He's like, obviously you not living with us is not helping you. You just keep catching more criminal cases. So I'm going to let you move back in. I got like rewarded for getting arrested. I think I'd been at like a halfway house before that point or whatever the case was that, you know, he let me stay there occasionally, but that's when he like, let me move back in there full time. Now this is where the story about, um, the, uh, my 21st birthday comes into play. This is where this all fits in. I'm sorry. I don't, I didn't mean to make this story so confusing, but this, installment of the series required me to like dissect the chronology because I was getting confused. I was like forgetting where things were. So anyway, rewind for a second or fast forward, if you will. It may have been after Albuquerque, whatever. This is what had happened. When I was in Vegas, when I'd burned, um, or when my friend and I had left, that night where we met the guy in the bathroom stall or whatever, and when we had left Las Vegas, right as we were leaving, when we were in the airport, the second time, the first time I heard the guy in the bathroom, the second time was after all of that. We ended up meeting these two, like, really good looking girls. Now we were like, we had like a horrible fucking trip the whole time. And we ended up talking to these girls and telling them that we were pro surfers. I don't know why we said that, but we're like, yeah, we're in Vegas to surf. There's like no ocean in Las Vegas. We're like, I don't know. That's how pro we are. We don't even need water to do it. Just think it. Told them some lame story like that. But we ended up meeting these girls. However the case was, and I exchanged these numbers. And these girls were like way out of my league. But we like told them we were pro surfers and all of a sudden they were like interested in us. So that's how I met this girl. I forget where she was from. I think it was like, I think she was from Florida. I think she was from Orlando, Florida or something like that. So after I got arrested that particular time and my dad like kind of like let me move back in with him. I was still strung out. Like, you got to realize that. Like, even when I went to jail, I was trading coke to some pice in there for heroin. I came out strung out. Like, I, like, did a shot right before I got released. My dad picked me up, and I was, like, all gout out. And my dad gave me an ultimatum. He's like, look. And he's done it a million times, but he's like, one more episode. I don't care if I catch you doing drugs. I don't care if you get arrested. I don't care if you're getting butt fucked by a hobo. I was like, hey, that was my first time on edibles. I was like, so what? No, I'm just kidding. My dad pretty much said, if I get caught doing any of that stuff, I'm fucked. Anything drug related in his house at that point, I'm screwed. I was like, all right. So I end up scoring, you know, I'm like doing heroin behind his back doing it with um with jeff and my other friend like the three amigos again ironically we're hooking up from the guy that i met when i went to albuquerque so this was after albuquerque and this is after i'd met that girl so that's why i got confused in the chronology i don't fucking know. i go to his house one time jeff's house because he lived like probably 10 10 minutes from my parents house we used to play some hockey game on his playstation I think it was called NHL Hits. We play that all the time. 
And I went over to his place. We were just, we'd like smoke bowls out of his ball. My dad would let me go over to Jeff's house. Like, come on, I'm only going to Jeff's house. It's not like I'm going to go shoot heroin there. Like right when I get to his house, like lock the door and we'd do a shot. My dad felt comfortable with me going there. I like, he knew that we were strung out, but like at least I wasn't out like running amok. And now I was like having to go to court for this new possession. So my dad was all mad about it and he's kind of keeping a close watch on me. So Jeff and I are playing this football game. He's like, dude, I got some really good acid today. You know, he's like one of my friends who he, he, I guess he ran into someone he hadn't seen for a long time that gave him some acid. And it was um, these little like jelly tabs or like these little tiny like jelly dots, micro dots or whatever. It was probably like 11 o'clock on a weekday. We were strung out at the time. We're playing this hockey game. And he's like telling me about this, Mike, this gel tab that he had gotten. He got like a few of them. I think he got two. I was like, I want to try it. Back then, I like zero fucks given about stuff like that. I'd take acid at any time. It didn't matter. It's like, oh, whatever. I'll commit to 16 hours of hallucinating right now. I don't care. So I ended up taking a tab. I take this tab, and I'm at his... I don't sleep over at his house. But I start tripping maybe like, I don't know, an hour or two after I took it. And Jeff was like, hey, um, I have to work in the morning, so you got to go back to your parents' house. I was like, what the fuck? I just took acid. He's like, I don't know what to say, man. I was like, all right. So I had to leave while I was tripping. This is after my dad had given him that ultimatum. So I ended up going up to my parents' house just tripping balls. You know, I didn't have my car back then. I remember I had just walked from his house back up to their place. And I had a trip in my room, like a lot of trips I've had, where I just like listened to Dark Side of the Moon and just kind of like laid in bed and tripped out. I ended up talking to that girl who I had met when I was in Vegas that I would told that I was a pro surfer. Like we had exchanged phone numbers. It was the kind of thing. And I'm like always been one of those kind of guys that like likes to talk to girls on the phone. I've always been like that. Sometimes I'm in here working and I get bored and I'll like call Karina. I'll be like, can we talk? She's like, you're fucking, your dick stinks. I'm like, I love talking to you like this. So me and her end up talking like all night while I'm tripping on acid. I have this like profound connection. It was really weird. Like hyper focused on it. And she tells me that she had moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico. I guess like her mom had remarried or something and they relocated. I think she was from Orlando originally, but they had just recently re relocated to Santa Fe. Like since I had met her, I think I met her like a month before that. And she's like, I don't know. Santa Fe is pretty close. Maybe we should get together soon. And we had like this crazy ass connection over the phone. Talked to her for hours. And I end up getting off the phone. She didn't know I was on acid either. I was just kind of like electrified by it. So I end up getting off the phone. And I rarely get horny when I'm on acid. I don't know. Did I ever tell you guys? I don't know if I ever told you guys this story. About, and she's probably watching, which is awkward, but real quick. Because this was such a recap episode. Make it a little longer than normal. I don't know if I ever told you the story, but there's this one night, I think this is in like 2016, I want to say, right before I met my ex-wife. So yeah, it was in 2000. Yeah, I thought you tried that one. And I was at Jeff's house again. I was probably 31 at the time, maybe 30. I think I was 31 at the time. And his parents were out of town. like So he had his own condo at this point. This is when I'm 17. And um, his parents were out of town that night. So he was like house-sitting their house. We weren't staying at his... And I was living with him. He, was my, he like let me sleep on his couch. But we were staying at his parents' like bigger house. Just like house-sitting it because they were gone for the weekend. 
And this girl ends up coming over. I don't know why, but I was like drunk and I was horny and I like wanted to have sex. I was like, I want to hook up with this girl. It was probably like four in the morning. I don't even know how she got there. She came over to his house and she's like, this is a girl that I've been friends with for a long time too. Like, ye like 15 years, she probably, I almost guarantee she watches this channel. And like, it was like four in the morning or whatever. And she's like, she's like, you know, I would love to do some acid right now. And we had some at Jeff's house. I was like, we have some acid. I was like, let's do it. Now, Jeff had just had, like, the most hellacious DMT trip of his life, like, three nights before this. We used to have it on camera, and I, I lost this footage. That footage would have gone viral. It was hardcore. He tripped on DMT for 20 minutes. Usually it's, like, five minutes, but he was going hard. 20 minutes, just tripping balls, and I had it all on film. It was crazy. Had a really bad reaction. So he just had this bad experience. So he had, like, a bad taste in his mouth. Didn't want to do the acid. I was like, and I was all wasted. I was like, come on, I want to get laid. This is an excuse to get this girl to come back to your condo. From his parents' house. Like, leave locations. Go back to where we, like, actually stayed. So anyway, to make a long story short, we ended up going to his condo. And we took acid at, like, 5 in the morning. Took a hit of blotter acid. This, this blotter acid, these little, like, flying rocket ships on it. And he starts having a bad trip. She's like, you pollute my life. You're toxic. I was like, me? He's like, yeah, and you smell like shit. I've always wanted to tell you. He started like just going off on me. I was like, uh, and she was sitting next to me. And I was like, hey, I like, are you all right, man? He's just like, just, just shut up. Just... Your volume is like a fucking 14 right now. It needs to be a five. Creepy, like, weirdo stepfather shit. Just on some weird-ass acid trip. So anyway, so, like, he's on some weird one, and she's sitting next to me with a blanket. And I don't know why, but, like, I already was trying to hook up with her before this. But, like, after, the, like, once the acid kicked in, I got on some, like, weird hypersexual trip with this girl and i get like like eventually jeff fell asleep on acid probably because we took it at five in the morning but still it's really hard to do that but he passed out so he's like sitting in this chair and she's sitting next to me and i kind of like crawl my hand she's wearing a skirt i remember she's wearing like a naughty school girl outfit that i think she was like at like a themed party before we met up with her but i like put my hand like on her thigh and like crawled up my pa my hands into her panties and like kept almost getting there and she'd like swap my hand away and on the acid i just got completely like obsessed with this idea then it's not like i was being a creep like it was playful on her side you guys are like sure buddy fucking scumbag no she check out how the story ends i wasn't like Listen on some weirdo shit. So anyway, so eventually, I make it, like, all the way. And she lets me in. I end up, like, I don't really like talking about sex, but I end up licking her ass while I'm tripping. Like, under this blanket. Like, while my buddy's just passed out. And I remember just, like, this insane sexual charge, like, took over me because I was tripping so hard. I was like, let's go into the bathroom. I went into the bathroom... And I lasted maybe 10 seconds. It was the most random night ever. That You have to admit. I, I guarantee you that girl watches this channel. That was weird. I don't know. We were friends before that. It was fucking... And then they started dating right after that. It was the weirdest shit ever. Um, the point of that story... Oh. Because I can only think of two times in my entire life that I've had that kind of super hypersexual energy. It was really weird. Like, I, like, kept trying to touch her, and then I, like, ducked my head down. I was, like, licking her ass. Trip. Imagine that. A chick you've been friends with for, like, 15 years, and you're on acid licking her butthole. It was heavy. I was like, this, is, this experience is rocking me. That's how I felt that night 
when I was tripping after he gave me that gel tab and I was talking to that girl on the phone and she didn't even know, but I was like beating off talking to her. I was like, yeah, what are you wearing right now? She's like, sweatpants. I was like, what do they smell like? She's like, smell like? I was like, yeah. What do they smell like? I started being really weird. So I ended up getting off the phone with her. Now the sun's coming up. And she had told me that like, she lived in Santa Fe and she wanted to like, meet up with me in person. So now the sun's coming up. I was really horny and started jerking off. Now this is before the days of like, um, like where you just have your cell phone and you can access anything you want in the world. Back then, I don't even know. Like I'm trying to think of how we beat off back then. In my imagination, I feel like it's the Wild West. There's, like, pages of porn magazines, like, scuttering by, like, tumbleweeds. But it wasn't that ancient. Maybe I had porn magazines. I don't know. But I remember I started beating... Oh, no, I had porn uh, videos, DVDs. That's right. So I, I was, like, I was just getting it. That was the two times in my life that I've been horny like that on acid. And so I remember I got bored just jerking off. I was like, this is, fuck this. But of course I'm like so fried out. I didn't even think of like calling a woman. So I called Jeff, no. I found like one of these, um, you know how like they have those like styrofoam, like Dodgers one hands that like fans have and you can like hold it up on a stadium i saw one of those i was like i'm gonna fuck that and i had a condom i don't even like wear condoms i don't even know why i had one i think it was just like so that my parents wouldn't think i was as much of a scumbag as i was I, like just kept it on my nightstand it's like yeah i use these when i when i'm not here yeah so i put this condom on and i start fucking this Dodgers hand and it felt real I was like this feels like I'm fucking a fan or whatever I thought it was fan and I remember and this is way before I've been to prison and started like having sex with mattresses sorry for any family members that watch this and also the girl whose ass I licked on acid I don't know so I remember thinking, I'm like, damn, doggy style would be fire right now. So I end up putting the Dodgers hand, like I had like a king size mattress, but it was like fat, you know, it like stood up on a bed frame. So I stuck the Dodgers hand in that and it had this like open flap. And I remember like taking off all my clothes and like, lathering it with like Vaseline I think I like rubbed some on my chest my parents took off the locks for my doors because I was a heroin addict there's no lock to this day at my parents house there are no locks on the door I've been caught having sex so many fucking times they've caught me having sex with her countless times my parents were like what are you doing I'm like what is it what does it look like I'm doing we're we're fucking exercising Jesus, close the door. So I'm sitting there on my knees, fucking, because, you know, there's no way to lock the door. And I'm just humping my bed. Like, I'm not, this is a 100% true story. I'm sitting there, I'm just getting it. Oh, and I'm like moaning, I'm making like Tarzan noises. I'm like, oh, oh. Making ugly sex faces, like, ah, oh, ah. Oh. I don't know how long my dad was in there, but like, like, I like, I remember like turning, like I had my eyes closed and I like looked up and there's just porn on my TV. It was like some porn movie, probably lesbian ass licking. That's been my jam for a long time. And my dad is just standing there and he has his hands on his waist. He's like in his tidy whities. He's like, what are you doing? Now, there's no way to explain that. It wasn't like getting caught having sex with a woman. I was having, getting caught having sex with a fucking object it was really like hard to explain so i told him the truth i was like dad i'm on acid so what 
I'm expressing myself. I'm fucking horny. Leave. I'm not going to stop. I don't care. I'm high. And my dad just looked at me like, Jesus Christ. You need medication, man. I was like, ah. And so he ended up leaving. But I told him the truth. What the fuck? It was because I was fried out. I don't know what I was thinking. So I ended up getting caught having sex with my bed, pretty much. And that went on for, like, a long time. Like, now it's, like, 9 in the morning, and I'm still, I'm like, oh, now I'm, like, emboldened by it. I'm like, yeah! I'm, like, breaking wine bottles against the fucking wall. And I passed out at some point. Anyway, I wake up the next day, late in the afternoon. You know that, like, after you do acid, you're completely drained the next day. I was, like, taxed. My body was fucked. And I see my dad, and like I try to act, like I remembered that it happened. I try to act like it didn't. I was like, God, damn, where's the almond milk? God damn it! Fucking hate how you guys are always drinking the almond milk. Yeah, there's three of us in here. I should. Ha my dad's just like, you know. I think last night was that. I think that was the the end of it, Ryan. I think I can have you here anymore. I was like, come on, Dad. Why not? It's not like I was hurting anybody. It's like, Ryan, I don't know. Made me feel uncomfortable. I'm like, that made you feel uncomfortable? I was like, what? Is this some Al-Anon shit again? You're enabling me? I was like, that's fucked up, Dad. I just caught a case. Like, I need support right now. Dad's like, I don't know. No, I mean, I told you the deal. No more drugs at the house. You gotta go. Now, at that point, I believe he had paid for sober livings, and I'd gotten kicked out. I know I was at the sober living the night that the thing happened with the stripper. It's just, you know, it's kind of hard to remember the chronology, like I said. That's why I spent so much time in this episode um, kind of recapping it. I'm not going to do that again. It was just, it was necessary for this episode. Uh, but this is what ends up happening. So my dad kicks me out. Like I said, I just caught a new case for a cocaine possession. And like I'm back in that time period, a simple possession like that was a big deal. And that was like my third one. That was either my third or fourth one. They're talking about prison time. I was like, fuck. And my dad kicks me out. Now, like I said, Jeff was letting me stay at his house like here and there. But that resources dwindling and then Roland's house I think around that time that's when his mom committed him for the first time I think that's when I called about the cat pretty sure that was around the same time whatever the thing whatever the situation ended up being I had nowhere to stay like I was kicked out of my parents I had like I was spending nights like on the street again I was like, fuck. So I called that girl in Santa Fe, the one that thought I was a pro surfer. I swear to I was like, you know, I think I want to come out there for a little bit. She's like, oh my God, you should. She's like, I live in this add-on that's above the house, or above the garage. She's like, it's like literally private. She's like, do you have like some sort of competition you have to go to in Hawaii? And I was like, for sure. I'm just trying to lay low until then, though. You know what I'm talking about? Maybe I'll get some magazine spreads while I'm staying at your place. So she like actually wanted me to come out there. Somehow I like talked her into it. But I didn't have any money to get back to New Mexico. I just left fucking New Mexico. And I was like trying to get back there. And I do make it back there. But we will get into what happens in the rest of this uh, in the next installment. And so, like I said, again, sorry for the recap. It's not going to be like a trend. But I'm telling you, this was shit was getting so confusing for me. I was like, uh, I need to spend some time like explaining like exactly where we're at in my life. So this is like the period between Monterey, Rehab, to when I started selling drugs, right around, I turned 21 right around that time. So this girl, pretty much the only option I had 
was to go um, back to New Mexico, of all places, the most random place. I'll tell you how I got there and how the disaster of all that in the next installment of the series. Thank you guys so much. Please like, comment, subscribe. Check out patreon.com slash Ryan Leone. Palabra.